school, my high school, uh, in class, uh, class of 1993. And I'm a Woody Jenkins, class of 1965. Cameron Cipriano, class of 1990. Anisha Green, class of 1990. Parker Hall. Still my high class, graduate 1992. Hank Kennigan, class of 1966. Michael Stewart, class of 1996. Ava White, class of 1995. Wayne Messina, class of 1964. James Messina, class of 1988. Cornell Washington, I did not graduate from the class of 68. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, for the audience, as Ms. Mike indicated, there will be no questions from the audience or comments. However, we do have comment cards. If you'd like to make a comment and share that with us, we would gladly appreciate it. So we'll begin. Um, my name is Dennis Stewart. I attended Southern University, graduated social studies education, summer of 1999. I um, started teaching in Rapids Parish in 1999. I've taught middle school and high school. Um, from there, I moved in 2001. I moved to 2000. I don't even remember when did I move. I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, 2006, somewhere up in there. And um, I taught middle and high school. And that's where I became an administrative assistant. That's where I found that I wanted to go into administration. And then I moved back to Louisiana in 2010, uh, family uh, reasons. And um, I was assistant principal at a fluent middle school. And I wanted more of a challenge. So somewhere down the line, I was trying to figure out my challenge. The superintendent decided um, that he would like to move me to a more challenging school. He knew I wanted to do that, it was just where. Um, I stayed there seven years. Within the seventh year, um, there was a removal of one principal at a school similar to mine, and um, the superintendent decided on October 9, 2015 to call me in. I was sick on that day, and told me that you're gonna start at that school and take over on that Friday. Um, didn't have any time to think about it. I had to hit the ground running. It was a hot mess, and um, it was a challenge. Within that plan, within that time in November, I had to come up with a plan of action to deal with the faculty that I had, and um, we put our heads together and said, look, we have to get the job done. And I put, changed the master schedule, went in there and just, you know, regroup, put that plan in place from January up into testing. We worked hard, put in a strong RTI plan, and, uh, we moved five point, six points with what transpired in that year. And if I can go in detail, which I'm not, you would know it was a very challenging experience coming after somebody and everything is screwed up. So, but we did move 5.6 points, so we went from a 39.9 to a 45.6 within a plan of action in a three and a half month time period. And so then I got rid of 17 people. I, they found them a new location. But, um, and I hired 17 new people, and I knew that was gonna be a challenge for me this school year. I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you know about the Stroma High School, the history of the school, and the surrounding community? Also, if you were selected to be the principal of a Stroma High School, what would be your vision for the school? And how would you allow stakeholders to collaborate on a shared vision to rebuild and maintain the school in this community? I'm going to, uh, I believe in telling on myself and telling the truth. Uh, and I wrote a whole bunch of stuff down with looking up the history. So I want you to know I did look up the history of Estrema High. Do I really know about Estrema High? I, the only thing I know is we played them at Peabody Magnet High School. I'm a Peabody <laughs> graduate, and I do remember Estrema, and I do remember Estrema whooping our butt sometime. Um, but um, I have everything down. Y'all gave me minutes. I don't think I can, you know, I, I, I got down here Struma began in 17, 1917 in the two room, two room frame building, corner of Erie and Winona, first grammar school grad, 1921, first high school grad, 1924. I could go on and on. I'm gonna stop there. I know in, um, that it was 
you know, kind of similar to the school that I'm at. It was affluent at one point in time, and through the changing demographics, things changed, and, um, and when the demographics change, you have to kind of change. And so that's where I am, but I will go into, you asked me, my um, three to five priority items. I would say familiarizing myself with central office and contacts with questions, uh, things needed, interviewing potential admin teachers, staff members for the school, connecting with the community, um, leaders, stakeholders, the members of that area um, of which the school reside, and based on my hiring plan, PD based on needs of the staff members prior to the opening of school. Anything else? Oh, let me hold on. Don't let me miss nothing. I'm nervous. Um, I believe that um, all stakeholders, in order to move a school, everyone is important. Everyone is important, and it starts with the parents. The school that I'm at now, um, they did not appreciate the parents. I believe the parents may, whatever socioeconomic status you have, they're sending their best. Now, your best and my best is two different bests, but at the end of the day, they want the best for their children, regardless of what um, type background that child come with. Describe a three-year technology, career, and tech education and AP dual enrollment plan for your building to include purchase plus professional development for your teachers. What resources are in your plan to utilize and seek from the district and community to support the plan? Uh, going into this school that I'm at now, I mean, it's so, so similar because um, the former principal had to he used his Title I funds to um, purchase, I mean, to assign $3,000 bonuses to staff members. And so it killed you being able to do anything else, and we were tied into that. And uh, this is the last year for that. And so that ends. And so what I would do, I would focus on the technology needs now. That's where you have to deal with the technology director. Um, the school being renovated, um, I'm assuming that it will be up in that area. So I would look at Title I funds, Title II, and see what can be done, what the district will help provide um, monies towards technology, because that's a big piece in the school, to look at Promethean boards, um, ELMOs, everything possible to be able to um, approach education different. You go into my classrooms, um, that's a big piece at my school student engagement. You can't do student, you can't really engage students with old chalkboard and a piece of chalk. Um, although I tell my teachers when technology run out, you gotta have an alternative. So you may have to go back to that chalk. Um, I would, career and technology, tech education, we have to pour into that. Um, I believe that there needs to be a track for every child coming to your school. I believe there needs to be a focus, um, a freshman academy. And people focus on freshman academy, but I think you should focus on sophomore academy as well because that's where the dropout rates kick in ninth and tenth grade when you get them past that they pretty much know where they want to go so everyone need a track starting from jump start jump start need to really be embraced at the high schools you need to go from jump start and making sure every child that is not college bound not an honor student not an ap student have some type of success and that's catering to each child that come to your school and that's what I do at my school. Every child is important. I don't care if he's at the bottom of the barrel. Um, that child needs to experience some type of success when he leaves my middle school. Um, and you also said, what is the question? Let's see. AP and dual enrollment, Southern University and LSU, that's why they are there. That's why BRCC is there. There should be a connection. There should be a, 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 a collaboration between those schools. We have LSUA and LC where we work with them with our high schools where they come in and we have instructors from, oh, it's time. <laughs> define an effective athletic program and include the extent that it defines the culture of the school. How would you rebuild <clears throat> the athletic culture for the Lewis Drummer High? Athletics is a big piece. The three A's on my campus, um, it's academics, athletics, and activities. That is very, very vital on anybody's campus, and especially at risk. 
When I came into this school, first thing that I wanted to know, how are we impacting the student body with our athletics program? I, there were 20 young men that were picked to be on the football team. I got rid of every coach at the school. I told them your services at this school are no longer needed. And I um, hired, interviewed, and um, new coaches, and I informed them just the way it was gonna be at that school. And um, I told them, instead of 20 students, let's go get 60. Because if you get 60 boys on that athletic, uh, that football team, we're going to be, be able to make a huge impact. And you're not going to just be coaches, and you're not going to be those coaches who um, teach history, because I was a social studies ed major. That's not going to happen on my campus. You are going to be an academic person in that classroom. And when you're in that classroom, you're going to give the very best. And when you're out on that field, you're going to give the very best. You are mentors. So when you're not coaching, you're finding out what's going on with those students in that classroom. So in, athletics is very, very important and vital to the building of a school. And everything should be centered around that. I mean, every child on my campus has to be a part of something. Athletics, activities, or clubs, when you're a part of something, my discipline is gonna go down. And that's what happened at my school, my present school. What is your understanding of a community school? How will you establish a Struma High School as a community hub? while building a positive working relationship with the PTA, PTO, local businesses, and community service representatives to involve all stakeholders in the reopening of the school. Have a big party. That's what you have. You open, it's 100 years, that's what I know. And um, I just believe at my present school, um, the community and the school were separated. The school was an enti entity by itself. And the community, drug infested, I mean, um, just some of everything. And I needed to come and bridge the school and the community. And so number one, they saw the principal. I walked my students home every day, every single day. We walked past the drug dealers. And I taught some of the drug dealers and I tell them, can't get these, we're working with these, you know. and. They respect and they laugh at that, but they respect me because they see the principal. Not the assistant principal, not the dean of students, not the teachers. They see the principal. When the principal lead the way, everybody else will follow. So that's, that, that, that is a big piece. The community is a huge piece to the success. Uh, the school is a huge piece to the success of the community as well. So we involve the community, the PTO, PTA, all of that has been new at my school because it was not there. It was not there. It was more so people coming to work to, for a job and, and disregarding the community. The community is the hub for the school. And when you find yourself getting in the community and having those family reading nights, family math nights, family social studies, getting those things that will involve the community, bring the community back in, going door, I put everybody on the bus um, and, and, and I went into the neighborhood to let them see. I have some teachers that are from across the river. If you're familiar with Alexandria, you have Alexandria Pine there. So they come from across the river. Okay, you're in a, a nice area. Let's go in this area. Let's see where our kids are, where they come from. And let's see how hard our parents do work. Yeah, you got some bad areas in the neighborhood, but all, everybody's not bad. I come from a, a, a bad neighborhood. But my mother was a hardworking mother for, for five children. She wanted the best for her five kids. She worked hard. So um, everybody is not poor. Everybody is not low socioeconomic just, for, just because they're from that area. So I believe that coming together with the PTA and getting the right people to um, support the school and letting them know that it, it is a new vision. It's a new principle and with a new principle, new vision and you want everybody to play a part in uh, rebuilding of the Struma High School. Just as what I'm doing with the present school I'm at. What are the crucial issues facing public schools today? What plans do you have to address such issues? Discussing your plans, how you as a principal would market and recruit in competition with surrounding charter schools as you face with these issues and challenges. The crucial issues is that we are leaving kids behind. 
We are not addressing the needs of the kids. Um, I see that right in Rapids Parish, and we're trying to figure that thing out as well. Um, my problem right now, I'm at the middle school, and we're, they're looking at merging middle schools with the high, certain high schools. And I'm for it and I'm against it. I'm for it because if we merge, then the question is answered. Who takes over from when I send the kids on? They, they can have an awesome sixth, seventh, and eighth grade year. But then when you've addressed and met the needs of those kids, when you send them on to the high school, if they don't meet their needs, then they fall by the wayside. So I think the, the critical issue is accepting all kids for where they are educationally and meeting their needs and making sure every child, regardless of his um, you know, um, educational background, get to experience some type of success, whether that's jumpstart, whether that's um, college prep courses, whether that's AP courses, addressing the needs of every child that come into your school. And I think a lot of kids have been left behind because of that, and I think that's a big problem for us. Um, my plan would be um, at my present school, I told you I had hired 17 new teachers. I didn't have a problem with that. A lot of district office stated, 17? I said, yeah, 17, I'm not afraid of that. You know, my hardest part would be um, developing those teachers. And I believe if you recruit, and that's a gift that I have of spotting a person that has passion for the job and compassion for children. And when I spot that, and I don't look, I don't judge a book by its cover, we're quick to judge a book by its cover. And if you come to my school, and any one of y'all can visit me in Alexandria, Alexandria Middle Magnet, and I will show you what a middle school at risk, predominantly African American school looks like. And when you go in my teacher's classrooms, you see student engagement. You don't see clowning around, you see student engagement. Um, so I believe that, you know, you just have to take every classroom one at a time, one person at a time, to find out and dig deep. I have three steps to my interview process. One with the administration staff. Two, um, that's with the teachers you're gonna be working with, if it's the math department, science department, so you're going to sit with those teachers because they have to work with you. And three, you're going to do a, a, a mini lesson for me and my staff to watch to see if you're gonna be a good fit for Alexandria Middle Magnet. So that's the same thing that I would do at a stream. I take every classroom one at a time, one person at a time, and dig deep to make sure you get the right person in at that school. Value based school of its kind. How would you describe a value based education? Making sure that every child understands the value of an education. Making sure that every child has a mentor that is not only going to educate them, but also be that mother, father, best friend, teach them how to respect adults. Teach them how to respond in situations because that is our biggest problem. My, uh, my way of thinking in my school, for instance, discipline. Well, we, my assistant principals, they are assigned and my instructional coach are assigned to each grade. So I have an administrator over each grade level and that's who they work with. When they are written up on a referral, which my, I don't have a lot of those because we cut down, it's cut in half. They get a referral from a teacher. You don't go to the assistant principal office and sit down and go through the process. They're used to that. I have a courtroom on my campus. I have a law magnet program and I'm rebuilding that. But I use that law magnet as a place where my assistant principal act as the judge, sit behind the, the desk. I have my bailiff, which is my resource officer who pulls up attendance, who pulls up behavior and all of that good stuff. And then that child stand in front and, they, and it's just like a courtroom. And they stand there and we go through the referral. What did you do? Now everybody that come in that courtroom is guilty. You're guilty. 
Mm. Now, you can come in here and tell the truth. And you tell me what you did. We give you a lesser sentence. And if you lie to me, I give you a harsher sentence. And let me tell you, discipline went from here to here. Know why? Because they don't want to go to court. Our rationale is if we keep you out of this courtroom, you're going to stay out of the one downtown. So everything, we are very proactive at my school, not reactive. We tend to react and then want to cut up. No, we are proactive on that campus. And if anybody want to come visit me at my school to see all of this, you can. Mm -hmm. Can I say one last thing? Yes. That I forgot to say. Two things that are very, very important to me and dear to me. Um, number one, after my first year of teaching, I was um, named Teacher of the Year. After my first year of teaching, after my, I was appointed here in October, I was nominated Principal of the Year within that time period. So I think a lot of that speaks for me. I believe in children and I will run anybody out of my school if you're not the children. Thank you. class of uh, 65. Camera yeah, sitting on class of 80. Alicia Green, class of 1990. Marcus Island, class of 92. Yes. Hank Kennigan, class of 1966. Yes. Michael Stewart, class of 1996. Yes. April White, class of 1995. Wayne Singer, class of 1964. Terry Smith, class of 1988. Yes, sir. Claudia Washington, of Renata Graduate of Stormont High School, this class of <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to meet you. Um, you have before you the members of the advisory committee, but only six members of the advisory committee will each ask you one question. They're asking the same questions to all of the candidates. All right? Okay. Um, if you see me happen to uh, lift up this yellow card, That's that me. means that you are at your two-minute mark and you have one minute left. If I raise the red card, then you have your three minutes have expired. Yes, so now I'm going to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, okay. and upon um, after that, Ms. Stiprion is going to ask the first question. Okay. Uh, my name is Reginald Douglas. Uh, I am currently the principal at St. Helena College and Career Academy, uh, and it's an honor for me to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to interview before you. Thank you. What do you know about a strong high school? history of the school and the surrounding community. If you were selected to be the principal of Stormer High School, what would your vision for the school be? And how would you allow stakeholders to collaborate on a shared vision to rebuild and maintain the school and this community? Okay. Uh, so what I know about a Stormer High School is this. I know that this coming school year will be a Stormer High School's 100th year in existence. I know that a Stormer High School has a long, rich history in a lot of different areas. I, I know that Estruma High School has a uh, rich history in athletics. I know they have a Heisman Trophy winner uh, from Estruma High School. Uh, I know that Estruma High School has Vernon Jackson who played NFL football uh, and a host of other professional athletes that came from Estruma High School. 
I know about the rich history of uh, uh, Elijah Tack Jackson and his coaching history at Astuma High School. I know that Astuma High School has a long political history. A lot of politicians that come from Astuma High School, from Mr. Woody Jenkins, who graduated in 1965, to uh, Byron Sharper, who graduated in 1985. I know that Astuma High School also, in uh, I think 2003, when, school, when failing schools were going corrective action, I know that Astuma High School at that time, that year, was the only school in East Baton Rouge Parish School System to come out of corrective action. I know that the uh, community, community uh, uh, from Astuma uh, has a lot of pride. And proof of that, we're here today. Uh, something was taken from the Astuma High School community and they have fought and demanded that it's opened back up, and that's why we're here today. And, uh, and I think that I am the uh, principal that could uh, actually lead the way uh, uh, this coming school year. Uh, if I'm selected as the principal of the Struma High School, uh, the three main goals in starting the school year, the first goal would be to make sure that we have a qualified staff to start the school year. The second goal would, make, uh, would be to make sure that we have the acad academic infrastructure to have all of the classes that we want to offer to our kids at a Struma High School. And the third goal would be to work with the community to make sure that we have an environment that all of our kids can have a successful high school career. a three-year technology career in tech education and AP dual enrollment plan for your building to include purpose plus per professional development for your teachers. What resources are in your plan to utilize and seek from the district and community to support the plan? Okay. All right. The technology plan first. So we'll do this one first. So let me start from the end goal. For what, after three years, what would we like to see at a stream of high schools if I'm the principal at a school of high school. All right, first thing, we would like to have one-to-one -one computer, one-to-one -one computers. The reason why that is is because it opens the door for us to be able to, be able to do a lot of things inside the classroom, such as to have, you know, what we call a 21st century classroom, where we can have kinesthetic learning, where kids can get up and work in groups and use the technology to be able to do that. We can also be able to do flipped classrooms, and we actually do that where I'm at right now. We have classrooms that the, te the kids actually use the computers for most of the work on those uh, uh, during that class. Uh, so we can do a lot of things if we have one-to-one -one computers on campus. I would also like to have a smart board in every classroom. Uh, the reason why I, I would like to have a smart board in every classroom is because we can do a lot of stuff with that. Uh, for example, we can have virtual we can have virtual classes where we can have teachers from other areas to actually teach some of our kids. We actually have that at the school that I'm at right now. Uh, we would also like to have a computer lab, a computer lab uh, for the community. And the reason why we'd like to have a computer lab for the community, community is because we can have uh, people from the community that can come in, they can uh, apply for jobs, they can uh, work on an OSHA card on the computers, they can come in and just do research, or maybe even take classes online in this computer lab. Uh, so we would also like to have several computer labs for our kids. The reason why that is is because all of testing now uh, is, is basically done on computers, and so we need enough computers on campus to facilitate test taking time so we can do it in a longer period instead of having a short window uh, for testing. And what I mean when I say that is this, you know, if, if we have enough computers then we can actually start our testing, you know, at the end of the window instead of having to test early uh, in that window. So we give our kids more time on task if we have enough computers on campus. Define an effective athletic program and include the extent that it defines the culture of the school. How would you rebuild the athletic culture for the newest Stormer High? Okay. When I arrived at the school that I'm at right now, uh, we didn't have an athletic program. Our football team was winning one game a year. We didn't have a band. We had a band that had 20 kids in it. We didn't have dancing dogs. We didn't have cheerleaders. We didn't have any community support around our athletic program. This school year, we have a band that has over 60 kids in it. Three out of the last uh, 
Two out of the last three years, our band has won the national competition in, in Dallas, Texas. Our, uh, our football team now, well, this school year, our football team, the same football team that has historically won one and two games, this school year, we were, we were in the semifinal. We were one game away from the championship. Uh, I told you about the things that we didn't have. Now we have a flag team. We have twirlers. You know, we have a lot of things that kids can be involved with. So uh, the athletic program and the auxiliary that goes along with it is the spirit of the community and also gives kids uh, a reason to have school pride. So when I'm hiring, so the most important thing is hiring good coaches first. And so when I'm hiring coaches, I need, I'm looking for a coach that is not just talking about his program and talking about his voice of the team. I'm looking for a coach that's talking about his voice of the team. I'm looking for a coach that's talking about his JV middle school team. But I'm also looking for a coach who's talking about, look, how he's going to get the middle school kids involved with his program, how he's going to involve the little leagues and bring them aboard. And the reason why that is is because we want to create some community support around our athletic programs. And so we have to make sure that we have a coaching staff that's reaching out. And I also want to share this with you. Uh, and you can't get uh, orange from an apple tree. You just can't do it. So you can't have a quality athletic program if you don't have a good school. So one of the main things we have to do is make sure that you have a well-run school so that can produce a great athletic program. <clears throat> What is your understanding of a community school? How will you establish the Stroom High School as a community hub while building a positive working relationship with the PTA, PTO, local businesses, and community service representatives to involve all stakeholders in the reopening of the school? Okay, so I'm in a unique position because I'm at a high school right now that's the only high school in maybe a 20 mile radius and so uh, so I'll tell you what a community school is. A community school is a school that is concerned with several, several areas. First, a community school is concerned with the health of the community. It's concerned with uh, youth engagement, community engagement, and expanding learning opportunities for the community. Okay? So how I would, would so and I'll give you some of the things that I've done, and I believe we can do the same things at a Stroma High School. For example, around the area of health. Every year at my school, we have a health fair and we invite doctors and hospitals from the local area and even our own school-based health clinic, and we have a big fair, and it's fair. We actually get a lot of fun and games, but the people in the community and kids from the different schools can come and get screenings for their eyes, ears, and health, okay? And that's a way to get the community involved. We also partner with LSU and Southern University Ag Center, and the reason why we do that is because they come to the school, teach our kids the importance of healthy living, teach our kids about eating well, how to eat fresh, the importance of eating fresh fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we partner with, and they also have uh, a, healthy, a healthy cooking contest. And so we do these things to actually get our, to, to bring the community in and make sure that they, they're involved. We also, uh, around the area of youth, we, uh, we do a lot to make sure that the youth, the youth are involved. We're the only high school in that area, and we have a middle and elementary school. And so what we do is, and we can do the same thing here with the schools in the area. Whenever we have any expanded learning opportunities at our school, we also make sure that the youth from the surrounding schools are involved. If we have, a co if we have college day, then we're gonna invite the middle schools to come and take part in it, okay? If we have a motivational speaker, we're gonna make sure that we call a principal and make sure that they have the opportunity to come and take part in uh, the things that are going on at our school. We also have what we call uh, uh, parent academy and once a month the parents are able well we invite the parents to come out to our school and they have different classes so they have they have like computer classes uh, uh, they have what the back with uh, reef making classes they also have uh, self-defense classes computer classes and when it, at the end of the year once it's complete they get like a certificate of completion and so we do things like that to make sure that the community is involved in the things that we have going on at our school and we can do the same thing here at the Stormont High School. What are the most crucial issues facing public schools today, and what plans do you have to address such issues? Discussing your plans, how you as a principal would market and recruit in competition with surrounding charter schools, 
as you're faced with these issues and challenges? Uh, the two pressing issues that I see first is quality teachers and second is funding. And uh, so, so to compete with charter schools in the area, first, I'm in a unique position because I've had an opportunity to work in charter schools and I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. Uh, when I worked in charter schools, they didn't invest in the community. They didn't invest in the kids. They didn't buy new computers. Uh, when the money was all gone, they packed up and left. So we're here today talking about things just the opposite, which will attract kids to come back, which will bring the funding back. And so we're talking about community engagement here today. We're talking about you know, uh, a technology plan. So we're talking about all the things that are needed to make sure that people want to be at our school as opposed to being at a charter school somewhere. Akuma High School will be the first value-based school of its kind. How would you describe a value-based education? Okay, a value-based education is an education where you're not only concerned about uh, the college and career uh, aspect of a, a child, you know, where they're going to, going, to, going to go to college at, but you're also concerned about, you know, that child's well-being, you know, making sure that child is a loving, productive, and caring citizen who, when they graduate, wants to go on and do something productive with their education. So that is, uh, uh, that's what value-based education is. I didn't get an opportunity to, when you asked me about who I am. I, uh, so my name is Reginald Douglas, and I, you know, I'm the principal right now uh, at St. Helena College and Career Academy. I'm also a product of East Baton Rouge Parish School System. I've been, in, uh, I've been in education now for 17 years, and I've been in, in some form of administration now for 11 years. Uh, I'm currently the principal at St. Helena College and Career Academy. Before that, I was the principal at St. Helena <coughs> Elementary School. In the year 2011, 2012, as the principal at the elementary school, we were one of the most improved elementary schools in the entire state of Louisiana. Now I'm the principal at St. Helena College and Career Academy. Since I've been the principal at that school, our, a lot of good things have happened. Our ACT scores have, our composite scores have grown four points. It's hard enough to get one kid to move two points. Our entire our entire uh, school population, our ACT composite score has grown four points. Our EOC scores, our end of course mm -hmm. test, our EOC scores, when I arrived at that school, the average passing rate was, and passing rate is scoring good or excellent, the average passing rate was 23% of our kids were scoring good and excellent. Fast forward to today, now we're well over 50% of our kids, so we've add, added 30% of our kids uh, scoring good or excellent on their EOC exam. When I arrived at, uh, uh, well, can I share this with you? Right now, our school is in high school math, and that is Algebra One and Geometry. Our school right now is above the state average in those areas, which is a remarkable feat for a school that has historically been considered one of the worst high schools in the state of Louisiana. I shared with you earlier, and I'll repeat myself, when I showed up at the school, our athletic programs were, were not in existence. Uh, we didn't have, you know, uh, correct, uh, extracurricular activities for our kids to be involved with. Now we have a successful athletic program. Football team is doing well. Band is doing well. We have sports that we didn't have previously. We have softball, baseball for kids to participate in. And so we've done a lot and had a lot of successes in St. Helena. And I believe that if I'm selected as the principal at a Stroma High School, we can do the same thing here again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hennigan, class of 1996. Michael Stewart, class of 1996. April White, class of 1995. Wayne Cena, class of 1960. James Smith, class of 1988. Connell Washington, did not go this year, Stewart, 1968. Mr. McGee, you have the opportunity to introduce yourself and follow the introduction. Mr. Green, I want to ask you the first question. Okay. Uh, greetings. My name is Alton McGee. I'm currently a principal in North Louisiana. Um, the first thing I want to say, and I want to make sure that it's emphasized, every system that I've worked in, I've gained results. I do have a portfolio with me, so in the uh, uh, preceding matter or afterwards when we're able to speak, if you wish to see that, you can actually see that for itself. So I'm not just an educator who's taking buzzwords that sound nice and uh, fluffy and cute. I get results and I can prove it. I put up numbers. Uh, with that being said, uh, my mother is also an educator. I am a product of East Baton Rouge, although I uh, work in North Louisiana. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm a 2001 graduate of Glen Oaks High School. I actually had family that went to Astruma High School, and I actually went to Astruma, Astruma Middle Magnet School when it was still open. So I am very familiar with the community uh, and with the school one way or another indirectly. As far as priority items, number one, <coughs> In reopening a school, you need data. You need to know everything about every teacher in the building, everything about every administrator, what they can, what they can't do. Same thing with the students. I need test scores going all the way back to kindergarten so I can find out who they are because if we're able to shape and mold the um, program itself and specifically Jumpstart because it's tied directly into the Louisiana SPS, you need to know who you have so you can figure out where you need to go. <coughs> Number two, Lineal Administrator Training. There's nothing worse than one administrator saying one thing and the other saying the other thing and now your teachers are confused because the kids do figure it out and next thing you have a big mess. So I would need time well ahead, preferably if I could choose at least one of those administrators. I know that's not always possible, but we all need to get on the same page well ahead of time. Uh, the organizational chart duties and expectations um, need to be set ahead of time as well. Those things to go together. So essentially all of that is in place before the school year starts. So we have everyone with a list of duties or a general area because things change, we all know that. But I would at least want my organizational chart in place. Scheduling and academic programming. In my case at the school I'm at currently, I had to change the entire schedule and the entire academic program. I suppose that is a different ball game where you're able to do it from scratch. With that being said, the way your schedule, which teachers teach what. Again, that goes back to data because you have to know what your teachers are strong in. Some teachers are strong in discipline, some are strong in academics, some can do both. Let's be honest, some are not that good, but their personality is just something that really matters to the community, to those students, whatever the case may be. And they're just the type of person that they bring something that's intangible, but you still need them also. So your scheduling and <coughs> academic planning is key. I went too far? If we have time, oh, okay. If we have time at the end, we'll 
let you continue, but at this point we need to move on. My apologies, I, I'm sorry. That's okay. If I'm being interrupted, <laughs> I'll do the question. Okay. What do you know about Astroma High School, the history of the school, and the surrounding community? If you were selected to be the principal of Astroma High School, what would be your vision for the school, and how would you allow stakeholders to collaborate on a shared vision to rebuild and maintain the school in this community? In my opinion, Astroma High School, Capitol High School, Glen Oaks High School were all perceived in a very similar manner which they were very competitive, competitive academically, but not given the credit where credit was due for academics. I know the type of talent that was contained in those schools because again, it's a tight knit community. We all knew each other. Uh, but with that being said, my vision for any school that I work in, and I actually have it dated and time stamped in my portfolio, but I'm of the notion that for our schools in particular, no offense, Caucasians in the room, but for African American schools, we need to prove that we have scholars. We need to prove that we are able. We know that it's able, but that concentration needs to be there. So my vision, my part of it, because there will be a community part of it, is that we'll do whatever it takes to make a Struma High School and a school within ethical reason. So with that being said, I would like to be able to permeate that to the staff and to the students because I want them to know that they are able and we're gonna be using a model that has worked and will work in the past. Um, now, as far as having stakeholders collaborate, did, did you go ahead and ask that part already? Mm -hmm. So, with the stakeholders, number one, I want to use a three-tier model in which you have students that have not performed, students that are okay, and then students who excel and their parents to give their input on the vision. So you don't have a vision that's leaving anyone out. And then I'd also like for alumni as well to, um, because you know things have changed. I talked to Coach Adger at Glen Oaks. I didn't realize how many students, for example, are not from Glen Oaks but attend the school now. So you don't know what students are coming from where exactly until the school year starts. Therefore, I want the alumni's input on what the Struma has been in the past as well as those current parents' input on where we are and where we need to go in the future, if that makes sense. Describe a three-year technology, career, and tech education and AP dual enrollment plan for your building to include purchase plus professional development for your teachers. What resources are in your plan to utilize and seek from the district and community to support the plan? My answer to that, in quest that question, uh, is, is twofold, therefore I'm gonna go ahead and answer both questions at once. Number one, I'm doing my dissertation on career and technical education. That's how much I actually believe in the notion. Number two, as far as resources are concerned, I have a dedicated counselor who understands my model. I also have an assistant principal who would like to come over with me, who's national board certified, a former principal who's actually turned around two schools on her own. So we would have two models of academics that work. We can use one, we can use both or we can combine. Uh, we need to actually get the data on career interests, paths, and actually what's, you know, I'm not, I haven't been to Baton Rouge and lived here for a while, so I would also have to examine what's available in the community because when you're talking about Jumpstart, you wanna be guiding the students in a path that is viable for actual uh, career placement and then draw from the resources in the community so that they're actually helping and, and the community businesses are participating in specialized, specializing the training that the students are getting. Um, if ROTC is possible to gain, I'd like to get the ROTC program as well. And I'd like to go back to the old school and have career and technical education on campus, not having the kids shipped out if possible, starting with woodshop, welding, auto mechanics, preferably engineering since Southern has a wonderful engineering partnership, or excuse me, they have a wonderful engineering uh, program in which I'd like to partner with them so we're guiding students along that way for Exxon and the companies like it. Define an effective athletic program and include the extent that defines the culture of the school. How would you rebuild the athletic culture of a new Astrema High School? Coach Azure at Glen Oaks High School always taught us that we're running a program, not having a team. Therefore, 
Coach Andrew used to recruit from the middle and elementary schools. He also made sure that we had JV and varsity athletics. He also made sure that everyone was on pace academically, which also included a different set of standards for um, honor roll students. So they're driven definitely towards college, but all students are driven towards college, but there's a different set of standards, a different program for your scholar athletes. With that being said, today's children are different. They don't just work just to achieve. If you look at the things that they use, such as social media, uh, we're in the era of the human superstar, MySpace, Facebook, Snapchat, where they're directly in a camera. The students these days want to be recognized. They want to be acknowledged. Sometimes that's the only form of acknowledgement that they get. It's sad, but it's true. Therefore, by learning the psychology of today's current athletes, we can build an athletic program that makes them want to, it, you have to take the old values of athletics and you have to blend them in. You don't tell the students, hey, we're doing what we used to do when I was a kid, but you use those new things and those new techniques like for example you look at all your championship teams they have the nicest uniforms the nicest shoes because that goes into the kid's psychology if they don't feel like a superstar they won't play like one these days what is your understanding of a community school how will you establish a Struma high school as a community hub while building a positive working relationship with the pta slash pto local businesses and community service representatives to involve all stakeholders in the reopening of the school. Number one, my experiences have been that with seeking parental support in this day and age, you do better to start. Let me, let me say this first. Of course, parental involvement is open to all parents. However, if you look at a magnet school, any parental activity is full or uh, it's full of parents therefore most likely you're probably going to start off with parents who are already heavily involved and it may be wise to concentrate on that area and then grow if you get other parents great with that being said once you start with that core group whoever it may be the first key is staying busy uh, in my current position I have found that many people wanted to contribute to the school, but were either not allowed for whatever reason, God knows why. And then there were many who were just simply not asked. So I would create a task force to literally go out and seek partnerships, donations, schools or, or organizations that want to adopt the school, uh, anything we can to make sure that it's known that the help is welcome. Number two, we have to stay busy. Uh, administrators who stay behind their desks generally don't do so well with the current uh, trend of school systems in the state department asking for achievement. Therefore, the busier you are, not only the more effective will you be as a principal, but stakeholders are willing to devote more to a program that's proving that it's doing something. Even if it's not immediately effective, if you just show that you're trying, you never know who may come and say, hey, let me help you do that. And sometimes you just wear yourself thin if you don't have the help. Also, uh, again, just being proactive and seeking the support. You never know who may contribute if you don't ask, and I'm not necessarily just going to limit us to local sources either. What are the most crucial issues facing public schools today? And what plans do you have to address such issues? Discussing your plans, how you as a principal can market and recruit in competition with surrounding charter schools as you face or as you are faced with those issues and challenges. I think the most crucial issue in education today is that many administrators have not created more leaders. In doing so, now you see less people going into the field of education. So to counteract that, what I seek to do and what I do now currently, I'll give you an example. There was a teacher once who didn't say much at a school that I went to work at. She didn't do much. So I gave her a project one day. I just wanted to see what she was made of. 
and it turns out that she was an all-star at planning events. So I asked her, why hadn't you been doing this before? She said, because no one asked me to. With that being said, I believe in deputizing as many people <coughs> as possible on the campus, as many teachers, as many staff members. I believe in helping them get the qualifications that they need to move forward. I believe in moving as many teachers towards being an administrator or at least helping them to think like an administrator because if I can have my philosophy and my concept in the heads of eight or nine people on the campus instead of one or two as just a principal and assistant principal, even when I'm not there, my system is still working. Our system is still working. And you also have people who will go on. They'll, they'll leave. If you get somebody certified to be an administrator, they're not going to stay under you. But what they'll do is go on to say, go work for Mr. McGee because he's going to help you become an all-star administrator. Go teach for Mr. McGee because he's going to treat you fairly. He's going to show you things that are going to make you better. And if you need to go on somewhere, no problem. But essentially what you do is create an advertising machine and you create a school that speaks for itself and not only having students that want to attend your school, but teachers who want to work for you. Astruma High School will be the first value-based school of its kind. How would you describe a value-based education? Well, and this goes back to one of the comments I made earlier, so to speak, because the, the concept of pride in one school is, it's diminishing across the board. With that being said, to reteach that to these students in this current day and age requires more than just simply telling them. Um, and you can actually go to our school's website if you go on Facebook and you uh, use the search term DHS, M-C-G-E-E, -E, DHS McGee, that's the Dell High, High School official Facebook page, you can get an idea of what I'm doing uh, as an administrator, but essentially you show the students by example what to value. You don't just tell them what to value. For example, uh, when we do our honors program, there's always something that goes with it. So number one, I make sure my honors students have more trophies and more accolades than my athletes because I want scholarship to be valued. Then there's something like a parade done for or we get them on the field at halftime to, um, to show them off to the city. We put them in the newspaper. We do something to create superstars out of, our, out of our students who are achieving academically. And what that does in giving that image, which all the students seek out for, as a matter of fact, we've increased our number of honor roll <coughs> students by 15 or 20%. But you have more students who want to be seen and who want to be acknowledged, but they want to be seen and acknowledged for the right value. So you take those types of programs, those types of initiatives, those types of methods, and you create the value system through those. Now you have them posted, you talk about them, but at the end of the day, you have to lead by example. My name's Alton McGee. I take education very seriously. Uh, if given the chance to be principal at Astruma High School, expect results. Thank you. Jackie, Jackie. 
<laughs> Did you hear what I said? I introduced myself as a 1996 <laughs> The last time. What did Zena say? Just does a 66.